Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to our first ever 55 and Better Virtual Expo. Uh, today's session is number two in the series. It's entitled Managing Depression, Anxiety, and Panic Attacks. Uh, and with this pandemic, I'm sure that's an even bigger issue. My name is Al Manzi. I'm president and CEO for Prairie Mountain Media and also publisher for the Loveland Reporter Herald. Um, before we get started today, I'd like to remind everybody that on the bottom of your uh, device screen, there is a Q&A and a chat button, and you can ask questions at any time. I'm sure there will be ones today um, from the audience about uh, depression and anxiety and panic attacks. So you can ask those questions anytime during the session, uh, and when our speaker is finished, we'll start a hopefully a lively question and answer period, and we'll answer your questions first. So please join me today uh, in welcoming uh, Sandy Squickero. She's a licensed professional counselor and executive director of the Medical and Hypnosis and Counseling Center. So please welcome Sandy. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Greeley Tribune, I have in the past, and uh, work with them in the present. And they are such a, a wonderful, you know, group. And I feel very fortunate to be able to bring you information about uh, depression, anxiety, uh, and panic attacks. So first, I would like to make an announcement. It's a beautiful day in Colorado. And an hour ago, my granddaughter was born in Oklahoma. So it makes my presentation and my day a little bit better. And I wanted to share that with you because birth is always a wonderful thing. So just to go on further, I basically use a global plan and my global plan has to do with a consultation and assessment and a diagnosis and a treatment plan. With the consultation and the assessment being a very important plan of the diagnosis. So today I'd like to talk about the consultation. My consultation is a seven page consultation. And what I'm looking for, I'm looking for the initial sensitizing event that happened in a patient's life to cause them or basically, um, you know, tell them why they might be coming to counseling. So really and truly in my office, the consultation starts at the first phone call. I mean, basically, I ask them why they might be coming into counseling. And after they tell me, some might say, I'm coming in for depression. Some might say, I'm, I'm feeling low, marital issues, anxiety. I let them know what's going to happen once they get to, to my office. And when they get to my office, after the appropriate paperwork is filled out, we go directly into the consultation, knowing full well that myself as a counselor, I'm looking for the reason why they're feeling what they're feeling. So I want you to be a part of the process today as if you were going through the consultation because the consultation basically, again, is going to help me to diagnose. And when I diagnose anxiety, depression, or panic attack, I basically can figure out what the treatment plan is. So let's start with a consultation. Realizing again, that I am looking for the initial sensitizing event and the initial sensitizing event is an event that has produced a significant part of the actual diagnosis. And it's a threat or the patients perceive it as a threat to their 
survival, which causes a great deal of anxiety and which causes depression, panic attacks, or other mental disorders. So let's talk about the key, con the key points of the consultation. After the demographics, such as, you know, what is your full name? Where were you born? What is your birth? Who is your doctor? What's, where can I, um, you know, contact at you? Are you at what who is your emergency contact i go directly into medication it's very important during that first initial contact to know about what medications are you on if any have you had drugs or alcohol today and mostly what is your problem and how can i help you that's a very important statement that I make because most of psychiatry and psychology has to do with self-report. So basically, let's just say that they're saying, well, I don't know why I'm here. I've been feeling a low mood or I've been feeling what I think is anxiety or depression. And I usually say, how long have you been feeling this way? And so I will, you know, go into the history of why they are feeling what they're feeling and ask them if they have ever felt that way before. Let's say that it's depression. Have you ever felt depression before? Do you know what depression really is? And they'll tell me what they think it is. I'll tell them what I know that it is. And then I'll ask them on a scale of one to 10, on a scale of one to 10, one being that you feel no depression or very little depression, and 10 being that you feel a lot of depression, where is your number? And they may or may not give me a number. They may say my number seven. Well, I don't really know what my number is. Maybe it's more uh, anxiety. And I usually let them know that if they are depressed, that sooner or later anxiety is going to walk in. So then I ask them, do you know what anxiety is? And they will give me their def definition and I will give them my definition. And then I'll ask them to use the same scale again. This is all in the process of the consultation. And then basically, I will ask them about family and childhood history. Where were you born? Where did you spend most of your years? Uh, was your childhood unhappy or happy? Tell me what your father's first name is and who is your father to you? And basically the reason I want to identify family history is because I want a good looky-loo into what that person's family history is and child history is. I'll ask them about brothers and sisters and their relationships. And then basically I'll ask them about what they are doing now. What is your occupation? How long have you been in that occupation? Do you like that occupation? If I could wave a magic wand and if you could be or do anything you wanted to do as far as occupation, what would you do? Some people say, oh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I would buy a business. Some people say I'm happy in what I'm doing. And that gives me a sense of their present circumstances. And then basically I go into their family history. Why I'm looking for that initial sensitizing event again. And I do that by asking family history about what have, do you know any, or do you know about cancer in your family history? Has anyone ever had thyroid problems or heart problems? 
And then I basically talk about their illnesses. Have you ever had diphtheria? Have you ever had um, cancer or heart disease? And basically I've got probably about 20 diseases. Most people are pretty healthy. There are some that might say, I've always had a problem with my weight. Okay, what is your weight presently? And what is your ideal weight? And that basically is a red flag to why are people eating other than we all enjoy food. But is there something there as far as obesity and weight gain? You know, what am I looking at here? Am I looking at a person that just likes food? Or am I looking at a person that basically is eating their stress? After we talk about medical um, issues, I go into sexual history. Whether or not they're married or not, I want to know if they have a boyfriend or significant other or girlfriend. And, you know, basically, do they have any problems sexually? Why am I asking that? It again goes to my trying to find out what the problem is. And this is where basically I will have a couple pauses and someone will tell me, well, I have a great sexual history or, you know, I don't really enjoy sex and maybe it will lead to some type of molestation or abuse. And then basically, you know, that answers another question for me as far as initial sensitizing events. And then we basically go into childhood psychological issues such as uh, where was your childhood spent? Was it a happy child or unha childhood or unhappy childhood? What made it happy? What made it unhappy? I get a lot of information about that. Um, and then I ask them to close their eyes. And as they close their eyes, I close my eyes. And I ask them to take a deep breath all the way in and let it all the way out. And I'd like you to clear your mind. And as you clear your mind, I'd like you to tell me if you remember the first memory of your life. And so most people, after they close their eyes and take a deep breath, they'll say something like, oh, I remember I was at my, my grandma's house and I was playing on a swing. Most people have a pleasant memory of their first memory of life. And I say, about how old were you? And most people say anywhere from three to five. Well, I know that after that question, I'm going to be going into traumatic events of their life. And so I know if they remember a memory that was from three to five years old, then I'm going to start from five to 10 and I'm going to go five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, perhaps 30 to 40. I'm going to go to their current age as far as traumatic events. And this basically, again, gives me more information. And I'm still searching for that sensitizing event. So basically, if someone says, oh, I remember from five to 10, someone bullied me at school, um, I go further. And when I say traumatic events, I'm talking about deaths, bullying, any embarrassing moments, um, anything that basically rocked their world. And usually by the time I finish, I've probably got about a page that has to do with traumatic events. We never think about traumatic events. As we get older, I think sometimes we push them back. And yet these things are very, very important to the diagnosis 
remember diagnosis means finding the problem. And so I'm in the middle of the consultation trying to find the problem as to why these people came in or this person came in for treatment. And then we talk about the present social history, things about hobbies. You know, I always say, if you could change one thing and only one thing about yourself, what would it be? And I say, what do you think people say about you behind your back? And we go into certain things uh, such as suicide. Uh, have you ever thought of suicide? I get many people that don't want to answer that question. Do I have to tell you? Well, remember, the more that you tell me about your life, the more I can help you. So I would like to know if you would answer, have you ever had a suicide thought? Well, yeah, I've thought about suicide. Okay. When was the last time you thought about suicide? Oh, maybe when I was a teenager. Sometimes people say, I thought about it a week ago. And then again, your warning bell goes off. Okay, when you thought about suicide a week ago, was it a fleeting thought? Did it come and go? Did you want to get away from your life or was it a serious thought? And did you have a plan? If they had a serious thought, and if they had a plan, then you know that you have to go a different direction to get them help at that moment. And then basically after that, you know, I asked them, have you ever been arrested? Have you been in the military? After we've talked about the traumatic events, I usually will ask them, what is the most disturbing event that happened in your life? And is there anything that you feel guilty about? You know, depending on how much or how long the answers are, the consultation usually takes one or two sessions. So, you know, after that we basically talk about their faith and what they believe in you know what faith were you raised in and what is your belief system and have you lived in accordance to your belief system that has to do with their outlook in life I remember a story and every time I ask this question, I remember a young man that I worked with about 15 years ago and I asked him about his faith. And I, I said to him, I said, what religion you, were you raised in? And he said, I really don't have a religion. And I said, okay. And I said, so what do you think happens in your afterlife? And he said, close your eyes. And I thought, okay, I'll close my eyes. So I closed my eyes. And he said, imagine a big brown boot. So I've got George Strait's boot in my mind, imagining a big brown boot. And he says, imagine that the boot is just grounding out your life. And I, I remember feeling just so sad that this individual that was probably not a third away or probably was about a, a third away from his last breath, a very young person, that he, his belief system was of a boot stomping his life out. And I remember I said, okay, so as I opened my eyes, we went on to further questions and further feelings. But I thought about that boy and the boot stomping out his life for a few days. Finally, one night I woke up and I thought, I know, I know what it is. This young boy has got no self-love. 
that's got to be the answer. So the next time I saw him, I said, you know, I thought about the question about faith. And I said, you know, I'm very non-judgmental. For all that I care, you can believe in a rock. But you said that you felt that when you were at the end of your life, that your life would be stomped out. And I said, I thought about that. And he said, what did you think? And I said, I want to ask you a question. And he said, okay. And I said, do you love yourself? And he didn't say anything for a minute. And then he said, no. And I figured out that what he was missing probably had a lot to do with his experience in life and his childhood. Maybe no one nurtured him, but he didn't have self-love. I worked with this young man for about four years off and on. And basically he learned to love himself. He learned to value himself. And you know what? If this little seven page consultation does nothing more than if it teaches people that there is hope, well then I've done a good job. So after the consultation is finished, basically the next appointment is about my going through the consultation, talking to the person about their presenting problem and making a diagnosis. And basically, you know, the diagnosis, usually I'll say, have you ever had a mental diagnosis before? Have you ever gone to a doctor or a counselor? Maybe they've said you've got major depression or anxiety or PTSD or bipolar. Have you ever had a mental diagnosis? Because if they do, well, then it doesn't really change my diagnosis, but it adds to it. So I always talk to people about my diagnosis based on what you're telling me. Because again, uh, psychiatry, psychology is based on self-report and what we see, that's what we have to go on. That's why the consultation and assessment is so important. So basically I talked to them about their diagnosis. I explain what it means and what it's going to mean to them, to them. And then I basically go on with the treatment. So I basically take a um, approach with my patients and basically my approach is solution focused because I want my patients to be the best that they can be, to live a life that's a quality life. And I always say, oh, well, you've been diagnosed as bipolar. You're not your diagnosis. Do you want to be sick or do you want to be well? If you want to be well, you're in the right place. So let's say that someone has been diagnosed with depression. With depression in the United States, 17.3 million adults suffer from depression. And basically the depression is highest or depression is highest among the ages of 17 to 25 years. Uh, basically, um, if you're over 65, then they're saying that 6.5% are affected with depression. And since we're 55 and over, basically it's important to know that over 50, 8 million people are diagnosed with depression. And for seniors, sadness is not the number one symptom. The number one symptom with seniors or a symptom with seniors is that maybe they get confused, maybe they have trouble sleeping, maybe they're tired, maybe their uh, depression basically is caused by medication problems or vascular problems. 
but the types of depression include major depression, which is clinical, and dysthymia or persistent depression with the situational. And basically what I tell patients is whether or not you've got a chemical depression or whether or not you've got a situational depression, they all present in the same way. And some basically, some of the risk factors are family history, personal history, and you know, just brain chemistry. So depression presents with usually a low mood that is sticks around for two weeks or more. It interferes with your sleep patterns, your eating patterns, your concentration, and basically, you know, it rocks your world. Some people actually cannot get out of bed because of depression, whether it's chemical or whether it's situational. Situational would be maybe a death. Chemical is that there's no real origin. It just has to do with your brain chemistry. So um, as far as depression, you know, what are some treatments? Um, you know, psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, interpersonal therapy, and of course, I say imagery and hypnosis, because the bottom line is it's important to break the cycles and to break the cycle of depression and turn some of those negative thoughts that we have as far as depression into positive thoughts. So basically some types of depression are major depression. As I said, um, PTSD basically does fall on the under anxiety, but you can have depression with PTSD. Uh, seasonal affective disorder, postpartum depression. And, um, you know, what I'm saying is that all, any kind of depression is going to um, present itself with the same symptoms. So if someone presents with an anxiety and panic disorder, uh, that's a little bit different in that um, anxiety and panic, sometimes someone will say, I'm going through an anxiety attack, which what they really mean is that they're going through a panic attack. Panic attack and anxiety affects 40 million people in the United States. 7% of those people are seniors. And it is the most common mental disorder, anxiety and panic. Anxiety and panic is worry, 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 fear, fear, fear. Some types of uh, generalized anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, panic disorder, panic attacks, post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, OCD, we've heard of that. There, that means intrusive thoughts. Um, any kind of trauma has to do with PTSD. And the risk factors have to do basically with family, whether or not you've had a history of anxiety in your family. And in 2014, there was a study done and they attributed some anxiety among teenagers. They said that it had to do with parenting styles. So the treatments again, for panic and anxiety are psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, again, changing those uh, behaviors and beliefs that are negative to positive behaviors, um, interpersonal therapy that has to do with your interpersonal uh, family issues and hypnosis. Of course, medication, I wait for last to talk about medication because some people don't like to take medication. 
I think basically that they're scared to take medication. And I understand that because any medication that you take, whether it's for any type of me uh, mental disorder, but we're talking about depression, anxiety, and panic may have and does have their certain side effects. But I usually say to people that I feel really need medication, and that does have to do with their doctor because I refer to individual practitioners in the area as well as psycho, uh, psychiatrists. It's up to them really as to whether or not they feel that they need to be on medication um, for anxiety or depression. But the bottom line is if I feel that someone couldn't, can benefit from medication, I always say, well, try it. Take it for a few months, see how you feel. If you feel better, then with your doctor's advice, maybe you can get off it in six or nine months. If you need it for longer, then as long as you're feeling better, it's done its job. So of course I want to see people get well. And if medication means that people can get well, well, I think they should take it. But if someone really doesn't want to take medication, that is their choice. What can you do to help anxiety, depression, panic attacks? Well, imagery and medication. Uh, for anxiety, watch your caffeine intake. Think about lifestyle changes. Eat a healthy diet, exercise, um, you know, basically take meds, be compliant. If you're going to take meds, just don't take them for a couple weeks and then decide that maybe they're not working because most medications take anywhere from four to six weeks to work, depending on whether or not they're serotonin based or you know, something else that your doctor might prescribe for you. Take control of your life. Live in the present. Um, face your fear and your insecurities. Uh, depression, anxiety, panic, any mental disorder. Make it your renewal instead of your destroyal, dis destroyer. You know, pain is inevitable misery is an option. Thank you for your time. Sandy, that was outstanding. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, just listening to you was, was calming in itself. Um, we have, um, <laughs> Uh, we have one question that says, can you give us examples of symptoms that we should look out for in ourselves or family members uh, for depression, anxiety, or just stress? Okay. The symptoms, basically, usually there's anywhere from five to 10 sim symptoms. So let's start with depression. Depression is a low mood that will last two weeks or longer. There used to be a diagnosis called dysthymia, and now it's called persistent depression. And that meant it's still under depression, but that meant that you were kind of walking around in a low mood for either two years or over. That is a serious depression that basically is the same thing as situational depression. It just lasts longer. But some of the signs of depression are you lose interest in enjoyable activities, your weight gain, you either gain weight or you lose weight. Some, sometimes basically um, you have a problem with getting out of the house, you tend to isolate and um, Sometimes you may have bleeding suicidal thoughts. So I always say anything that you feel that you feel is not a part of your 
your body feeling. I mean, we all know how we feel and we know when we feel good and we know when something is off. But if the feelings of low mood or agitation last for longer than two weeks, then you need to consult a doctor. With anxiety and panic, it's that you're nervous, 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 and that you fear, you fear a lot of things. And basically, sometimes you're short of breath. Sometimes in a panic attack, you might sweat. Sometimes you might feel that your heart is a little bit faster than usual and you just basically feel out of sorts. And again, you know your body. So basically, if you're feeling something that is not right, don't wait. Consult a physician, uh, consult a mental health worker because there are people that want to help you. They want to help you heal. They want to give you hope and they want your quality of life to be the best that it can be. That was excellent. We've got a question here. It says, um, can depression be caused by an accumulation of traumatic events over several years? Yes, it can. And, you know, I think when I mentioned depression, I think I said that if I, this, if I didn't, I'll say it again. One type of depression is, um, basically a depression, a major depression that is recurrent or it's single episode. So let's talk about single episode. You don't feel like you've ever been depressed before, but all of a sudden you're feeling those symptoms and you think, what is this? I, I know this low mood isn't going away but I just don't feel like I'm interested in anything. I'm losing weight or I'm eating my stress or whatever. And you go to a diagnostic individual and that person says, have you ever, ever had a history of depression that you know of in your life? When you were little, did you ever have a low mood that just seemed to last and go on and on and on? Or is this the first time that you've ever felt depressed. Person might say something like, I lost my job. I lost my job about a month ago, and I just can't seem to get back on track. Then the diagnosis would be major depression, single episode. But remember, I said in the presentation, depression is depression, no matter what it is. It's just that some last longer and another may have different components. So that same person comes in and they, we take, we're in the consultation and I say, have you ever felt depressed before? Yes, when? When I was a teenager. Did you ever get help for your depression? Oh, I went for a, to a counselor for a while, but I stopped going. Or I went to a counselor, but I haven't been to one in 10 years. Okay, would you please tell me what do you think caused that depression? Well, my mother died. Um, I lost my cat. There was some physical abuse from my father. So once they start telling you, that's why that consultation is so important. Once they start telling you about their life, then you know that they've had major depressive episodes and you can diagnose them. That's your, you may not quite know what the um, sensitizing event is that caused the depression, although you may have a pretty good idea, but that basically tells you that they have had more than one depression in their life. So your diagnosis would be major depression recurrent. And folks, let me tell you, when you go to a doctor or you go to a counselor, make sure that you know what diagnosis they are giving you. That diagnosis follows you forever, okay? So if you're getting a diagnosis of major depression or anxiety or bipolar or PTSD, 
you know, diagnoses really are just so that we clinicians can build the insurance. But you have a right to know and you need to know the inside and the out. Um, you know, you need to know what your diagnosis is so that you, if you have any questions, you can say, well, what does that diagnosis mean? And you can look it up if you want to. So know what your treatment is about. That again goes back to the consultation. If you have any questions, and I know I've said that I take a seven pager. Some people take a two pager, but I take a seven pager because I want to improve the quality of my patient's or client's life. And the more I know about them, the more I can help them. So any questions that you have, don't be shy. Well, here's some more questions for you. Do you find that uh, personalities that would label themselves as perfectionists are more prone to anxiety or panic attacks? We're talking about OCD a little bit. Mm -hmm. Someone that always has to have a little niche for whatever they're oh. doing, you know, or someone basically that, um, you know, has, they are perfectionistic. And, you know, I really do feel that if anything, they're probably prone to anxiety. But remember what I said about anxiety and depression, they cohabitate together. So once you see one, nine times out of 10, the other one's going to walk in the back door. And on the same question uh, or a similar question, um, how much does heredity actually uh, show up in your practice? Uh, uh, Family and history, mm -hmm. a lot, you know. So, you know, we'll be talking about depression or anxiety and that's part of that consultation. Has anyone in your family ever had a mental disorder, whether it was diagnosed or not, did not, not diagnosed? Has it, anybody in your family ever had alcoholism? Or has anybody in your family ever been uh, diagnosed with addiction or thyroid or an autoimmune disease? That family history, believe me, is very important. And so one of the questions that comes up um, whenever we have anything medical anymore is, uh, uh, are you seeing or are you, or are you seeing patients effectively use marijuana or marijuana products uh, to, e to, to either treat or help uh, anxiety attacks or, uh, or depression? I have. And basically, a story about that is, you know, whatever helps the individual. I mean, I would hope that they would talk about their uh, marijuana use with their doctor. And I'll tell you a cute story that happened. I had a patient that I was working with, she was bipolar. So she was on some heavy duty drugs, lithium, an antidepressant, Latuda, you name it, she was probably on it. So one day she comes into my office and she says, hey, Sandy. And I said, what? And she says, I've decided that I'm going to wean off all my medications. It was right after marijuana uh, was legal in the state of Colorado. And I said, why? And she said, well, I think I'm going to try marijuana. And I said, okay, but I said, have you talked to your doctor about it? No, no, I know how to wean off. I'm just going to do it. I said, I really, really think you need to talk to your primary care or your psychiatrist about getting off these medications. She had been on medications for 10 years and I just felt uneasy about it. Oh, well, I, I might call him. I might not. Two weeks later, I get a call at my home. It's her husband saying she's, she got off all her medication. She started smoking marijuana and she's in the hospital. Okay. So they had to get her back on her medications. So I'm saying that whatever you do with medications, whether it's marijuana, you know, whether it's antidepressants, make sure that your primary care physician or your psychiatrist at least knows about it. They can't force you not to do it or to do it, but at least you have their support. And so talk a little bit about um, 
some self-treatment. Um, you know, somebody who's dealing with, has been dealing with panic attacks many years in their life, they, they handle them okay. What are the, what are the, what are the common things that people can do um, that can, that can have positive impact on their anxiety attacks or just their, uh, what might be considered like stress syndrome? You know, I really feel that with panic attacks and anxiety, the thing that helps if they don't abuse it and if they take it as needed is probably medications such as Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, but all those, addic- all those medications are addictive. So if, if someone is sensible with their medications, and by their physician agreement that they agree to take it as needed, that helps. But also life changes, you know, um, basically meditation, maybe a little hypnosis. You know, we didn't talk about hypnosis today because we mostly focused on psychotherapy, but find out what are some modalities that will help you meditation, hypnosis, changing your lifestyle, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, changing some of those negative thoughts into positive thoughts. Deep breathing is a big deal when it comes to anxiety and panic. Talking yourself out of the anxiety and panic. Why am I feeling this way? Is this rational or is it not irrational? And no, that anxiety and panic aren't going to cause death. I mean, these are panic or a panic attack can mimic a heart attack. And by all means, if you have chest pain or whatever, when you're going through a panic attack, a panic attack can last anywhere from five to 30 minutes. But if you're having chest pain, if you're feeling like you need to go to the emergency room, by all means, go to the emergency room. They'll probably give you a little bit of a, a benzo. Um, they'll help you to do some breathing exercises. But the bottom line is what you need to do is realize that you know this is going to be over. It's not going to last forever. And so what about just uh, just simple education for your clients in terms of them understanding more? Because that seems to be a common theme is when panic attacks occur for the first time, you'll very, very often people are very confused and very frightened by it. So they overreact. How much do you recommend that they just learn and educate themselves about what brings on panic attacks, what can control panic attacks, um, things like that? I think self-education is awesome. And there's many times, uh, there's a book out there called Why Am I Depressed? And many times your counselor should have a list of books or at least a few books that they can recommend uh, for panic and anxiety. If she doesn't or he doesn't, you can always go on the web and read about, you don't even need a book really, You can go on the web and type uh, symptoms of anxiety or treatments of anxiety and you can educate yourself, you know. So I believe in self-education quite a bit. And what about what about um, one of the questions we always get? We didn't get it today, but but uh, what about costs and coverages uh, for from insurance? Because very often people are afraid to talk about uh, their their depression or their stress or their anxiety. And then when they finally do, they've got a real, they realize that there, there, there are options. Um, so can you talk a little bit about costs and insurance for people? I will, you know, insurance is my biggest headache in the practice. And (laughs) it really is because the bottom line is each, first of all, you know, one of the first question, not the first, but one question that any practitioner asks is, do you have insurance or do you not? Okay. Most people have insurance. There are a lot of people that don't have insurance, you know, and basically each therapist will deal with that 
um, in the way that they feel that they need to deal with that. I always say if someone doesn't have insurance, well, why are you, co why are you coming in? Um, I believe that psychotherapy is a commitment. So basically, if you come in, I'm willing to adjust your fee, but I want to know that you are going to be committed to come, you know, to come in. But the bottom line is where most or some practitioners say, what is your insurance? And what the reason they're asking that um, is because they want to get paid, but they also want to know whether or not that person's insurance is in network or out of network. Most practitioners are in network with most of the insurance companies. So say uh, United, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, Cigna, you know, basically people are in network. So they get paid the in network benefits. What I do in my practice, after I ask for the insurance, I say, will you fax me or email me a copy of your front and back of your insurance card? Plus I need your date of birth because I will call for your insurance benefits. A lot of people don't do this, but I want to, you know, I mean, some people don't know what questions to ask. They'll get the wrong information and maybe they'll say they're covered, but maybe they're not going to be covered. So I just assume call myself. So I call for the patient's insurance. I ask about their deductibles, if they have a copay, and then I will call the patient back. So, you know, I'm not shy. My consultation is 120. If you're in network with the insurance, usually they'll pay maybe a little more than half of that. And you are not allowed to collect the rest of the payment from the patient. If you're in network and if you bill 120, and if the insurance pays 65 or 85, that is your payment. You're not allowed to go back to the patient and say, oh, well, guess what? Your insurance only paid 85. You owe me so much more money. That's the same thing on an in-network charge. The practitioner has got an agreement that they will accept what the insurance allows. So that's another reason why I call, because I don't want my patient to get the wrong information to give it to me so I don't know whether I'm upside or not with insurance. So subsequent that's pay, that's, I mean, that's, that's extremely helpful. Um, well, people don't know about insurance. And so that's why I want to educate them. And that's another thing. If in fact, when they call the therapist that they want to use, always ask about insurance. That's great advice. We had a question here. It says, what advice do you give uh, seniors who are feeling isolated now, especially due to COVID? Oh my goodness. Hmm. That is a difficult question because seniors, more than any people that I work with, they are taking this COVID thing seriously. Not that we're, not that all of us aren't, but the bottom line is you know, seniors, basically, they're at the end of their life. They've got to worry about finances. They've got to worry about getting sick. They've got to worry about being able to see their family. There's a whole ton of things that they worry about. God bless them. And the bottom line is, I always say, try not to isolate if you can, of course, if you're in a nursing home, that's a whole different story. But if they're still ambulatory and they're living by themselves and they have a, a granddaughter, grandson, son, daughter that can maybe take them in the car for a ride or maybe assist them, you know, when they get groceries, go with them, go with them to the cleaners, go to the Dairy Queen. They absolutely do not like to get out by themselves. It's that fear of getting COVID. It's in the air. We all know that. And I think with seniors 
And basically with all their problems, they're very, very careful about not wanting to get COVID or any other disease. So, you know, I always say, do you have someone that you can rely on, even your church or people from your church or whatever, that can help you break the cycle of isolation? Because we all know, no matter what age we are, isolation leads to depression. Your presentation was absolutely fantastic. Um, I appreciate uh, that for real. And, 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 a, and a unique, a unique style of presenting where you didn't just uh, go through slides. You actually talked to talk to us uh, extemporaneously, which I found to be very unique. And uh, Sandy, we thank you so much for for taking the time. It's my to, pleasure. To my us. pleasure. And I know, I know, everybody uh, on this Zoom call um, got a lot out of it. I sure did. So well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And please stay well. And thank you for everything you do for the businesses here in Northern Colorado. I thank definitely you. appreciate it. Thank you so much. We have a great team. Thanks okay. again, everyone. And we'll see you same time tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>